The Word of God says in Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 21, Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. This is the word of the Lord. Again, what a joy to dive into this book of Exodus. And we've, we've walked through the first chapter, at least part of it up till now. And in verses 1 through 7, we really saw the heart of God manifested, how he keeps his promises. And this big picture that now they're, they're multiplying even in the face of adversity. But we didn't just see the heart of God. We also saw the hand of man, the hand of man. And that was a hand of oppression. And we realize that even in this oppression and uh, in walking through these verses, we notice that by verse 12, that the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And then it says the Egyptians were in dread of the people. So it is actually backfiring on the very ones seeking to oppress them. But now we want to move from there, and that was verses 8 through 16, but now we want to look at this final part of the chapter, and I know picking up in verse 15, so there's a bit of overlap there, but uh, in 17 through 21, what we're going to see is the heroes, the heroes of earth. And so I really would like to call this particular message, podcast, Unexpected Heroes, Unexpected Heroes, because truly they do come from an unexpected place. There are three points, three uh, components we want to examine as we walk through verses 15 through 21. And you might be saying, why 21? Why is verse 22 not included in this portion since it finishes the chapter? Well, we'll get to verse 22 next time, Lord willing. But uh, the three things we want to look at is first, the emphasis, the emphasis that God puts on faithfulness. Then we'll move to the elements of godly faithfulness. And finally, the esteem of God um, in regards to faithfulness. The esteem of God in regards to faithfulness. So first, the emphasis that God puts on faithfulness. There's an example that I, I think of. Um, it's it's a, a film that came out a while back, 195 minutes long, may I add. And it's black and white. But the interesting thing is this. Uh, though it's black and white, there is just a bit of color added into it. The, the movie is Schindler's List, and maybe you're familiar with it. I, uh, Although it's a powerful movie, I certainly wouldn't um, broadly recommend it just due to some elements perhaps in it. But the, the, the message being communicated um, is very powerful, and it's the oppression of the Jewish people during World War II. But uh, in this movie, the only color, again, in that over three hours is this one little girl in her red dress. And then uh, the other thing is the Shabbat candles. Now, this is fascinating because it admits this brutality, the racism, the arrogant, uh, godless Nazi oppression that's going on. And as the, the ghettos are being emptied and as uh, the, the prison camps are filled and as the persecution of the Jews takes place, you see this one little girl and every time she appears... She's in a red dress, but not just a red dress. It's, it, it's fascinating because they portray her almost as if she doesn't even notice what is happening around her. That almost as though she doesn't even see the oppression going on. And uh, this was really a metaphor as a picture being used by the director of the film to indicate just how um, later on the Allied forces, but how um, here was all this oppression happening, and yet uh, many were so slow to be involved, almost as if they didn't even notice what was going on. And uh, and I'm certainly not here to, to make any point on that politically. Uh, the point is that in the midst of, um, let, let, let's say, a chaotic world, there is just splash of color. 
That's what I want you to think about when we come to Exodus 1. Because here in the midst of this oppressive regime of Pharaoh, whoever that Pharaoh might be, we see a splash of color. And that splash of color is not a red dress, but it is going to be two midwives. And these midwives are Shifra and Pua. It's also interesting because Shifra and Pua actually have very uh, potent names. When I say potent names, I don't necessarily mean the English per se, but Shifra means fair, fair. So I don't know what you think of fair, my fair lady, um, fair, this beautiful meaning. But then Pua and I know in English, pua might not sound the most beautiful, but pua actually means splendid. And it comes from this unused root, which means to glitter. So if you want a name in scripture that glitters, it's pua. Uh, I don't know if you're lining up to name your children, your, your next daughter, pua. But I'll tell you, you have a lot of great biblical backing for such an action. Uh, I can't help but Think of um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. When I think of Shifra and Pua, when I think of fair and splendid or fair and glittering, it makes me think of this verse that says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Does that not sound like Pharaoh's day? Among whom you shine as lights in the world shine as lights in the world. That is what these women did in their day. They shone as lights. And so we see this emphasis that God puts on these women. They were perfectly positioned in history in this perilous time to shine, perfectly positioned. Now, now many might suggest hey, being a midwife in that day wasn't a glorious occupation, but for God, it was right where he wanted them. And so we see the emphasis that God places on faithfulness. And what is that emphasis? Here in this chapter are two named women. And we're going to come back to that emphasis um, a little bit more at the end. But I want to move on. I want to look at what are the elements of the faithfulness that uh, really are brought out in regards to these two women. Well, going back to verse 15, you see the king of Egypt says to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, that when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you'll kill him, but if it's a daughter, she shall live. But then it says in verse 17, But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. What are the elements of godly faithfulness? Well, we start to see them come out here in, in this very first portion. Notice it says in verse 17, But the midwives feared God. And did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. Midwives feared God. See, earlier in the chapter, we saw that Pharaoh and the Egyptian people feared the children of Israel. Uh, now we see these midwives fearing God. What I, I want to make note of is this, that we're all going to fear in, in, a, in a good way or a not good way. We're all going to fear someone or something. In other words, there's always going to be this recognition that we are not the utmost authority. Well, in the midwives fearing God, I want you to juxtapose and contrast the two examples. In verse 12, notice that when Pharaoh and the Egyptians feared man, what was the result? It led to oppression. But when the midwives feared God, it led to obedience. When the Egyptians and Pharaoh feared man, it led to death. But when the midwives feared God, it'll lead to deliverance. And this really is going to bring up a point for our own life, and that is, whom do we fear? What do we fear? Because our fear is going to drive decisions. And notice here that these women feared God. So the first element of godly faithfulness is your focus. And notice their focus. What was their focus? It was on God. So they focused on God. That was the first element of godly faithfulness, a focus on God. Now, I want to go a little bit further in this um, focus on God, because the question is, do we let the laws of man dictate our obedience to God? Or do we allow the word of God to dictate our life? So do we allow the laws of man? Let me break that down a little bit more. Is there something today where man says, this is what you must do? And you say, well, God says something different. But in order to, 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 to get along with society, we compromise truth. We're unwilling to address things. We're unwilling to speak of things. We're unwilling to stand. We're unwilling to be thought of differently. We're unwilling to bypass that promotion. We're unwilling to, you fill in the blank. 
do we allow the laws of man to dictate our obedience or the degree of our obedience to God? Uh, I, I think that we need to maybe break down a little bit more um, what uh, what's being said in this passage, because there's a term here which might not seem too familiar to us. Look in verse 16. Pharaoh is telling the midwives that when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it's a daughter, she shall live. This is a very interesting term, the birth stool. Uh, it's also interesting how this has been translated in um, virtually every English translation. See, this translation of birth stool actually appears one other time in Scripture. It appears in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 3. And um, the, the term oven uh, is only used these two times in Scripture. And in that passage, you'll remember Jeremiah goes to the potter's house, and there's that picture of the potter fashioning the clay, and God is that potter, and he makes us, and you remember all that. But in verse 18 of chapter, in ch chapter 18, verse 3 of Jeremiah, it says, So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. At his wheel. Now, there you have the word at his wheel. It's speaking of a potter's wheel. Well, if I threw a potter's wheel in Exodus chapter 1, it doesn't necessarily make much sense. If it, if I, if it read, when you see um, the Hebrew women, uh, you see them on the, the wheel, on the wheel, on the potter's wheel, what is being said? Well, there's a little bit more to this. There's actually an, an article which uh, very um, well-written article by Scott Morshauser called Potter's Wheels and Pregnancies, a note on Exodus 1.16. And it's a very academic article as a whole, but um, our versions say, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, but literally in the Hebrew text, um, it would be when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see the birth stool, and see the birth stool. Um, so, so, so think about what's going on here. Um, why would I, as a midwife, go to an Israelite house and just look at the birth stool? If that's really what it's saying, what is the birth stool? Um, and I think there's significance to this. I think it brings out a completely other point. So I'm not saying this just because of um, words and because it's an interesting fact. I think it actually changes our perspective a bit on the passage here. So You'll notice translators are the ones that insert the word them into it. Again, when you see them on the birth stool, it literally is when you see the birth stool. So what does this birth stool mean? What are we looking at? Um, what is this oddity? Um, well, clearly the midwives, um, they would have known what the birth stool is. And uh, this is where you get a bit of history. And so I hope the history lesson isn't too heavy and, um, and, and let's say, cumbersome. But follow with me here. So apparently in that day, uh, the potter's wheel was regularly linked to pregnancy in ancient Egyptian religious literature and art. And the reason for it was they had this god named Hanum, or, um, K. H N U M, and it's this ram-headed deity who was depicted as an artisan. And it was said that Kanum would mold and shape each human being at conception upon his wheel. Okay, got that? And with the potential child being granted the physical and psychological traits that would define it as an individual, including that of gender whether it was a boy or girl. So during this time of fashioning, the developing infant was said to be upon the potter's wheel. Um, and, and this is significant because what the metaphor of the birth stool or the wheel is referring to quite clearly would seem to be the gestating fetus prior to birth. This is still a child being formed in the womb. And this actually makes more sense anyway because... Um, if you think about them uh, uh, giving the excuse they give and saying, you know, hey, the midwives, uh, the, I mean, the, the Egyptian women are vigorous, right? And they have their babies before we get there. Well, that doesn't negate what their job still was to do, and that's to eliminate the, the male children, unless what Pharaoh was trying to do was do it in a concealed way. He was trying to numb the fact that he was killing all these babies. And so what he really was doing in today's 
language is called abortion. They were eliminating lives before this baby ever breathed on its own. So Pharaoh is basically saying, go into the house, give them a prenatal exam, determine the gender. If it's a boy, you kill him. And, uh, and of course, Shifra and Pua say, hey, they already had the baby uh, by the time we got there. And, and this is, again, do your own do your own research. You'll hear people say different things on this. But again, this is the word, um, the wheel, same one referred to in the potter's wheel. And this is also Egyptian history. So um, we, we say these things very much um, pointing towards this seems to be um, the most uh, clear meaning of the passage. It's interesting to me, though. I'm not here to harp on the topic of abortion, although I think it's a very, very important one to discuss. Um, that's not the point of this podcast, but I was reading through different supposedly health organizations. What a, what a, what a mask, like the World Health Organization, WHO, and they, they have this statement that a lack of access to safe, timely, affordable, and respectful abortion care respectful how is killing a baby respectful but respectful abortion care is a critical public health and human rights issue um and then the center for reproductive rights said that um they want to ensure reproductive rights are protected in law as a fundamental human right for dignity equality health and well-being of every person i'd like the children to vote on that one for every person um but aside from what you think on it, what's the point of abortion? Well, why does abortion thrive? Why are there uh, 70 million abortions every year in our world? By the way, uh, you know, this is 2022 being recorded, and we're two years into the whole COVID-19 deal. Let me just say the number of people worldwide that have died from COVID-19 all over this planet only make up the average of one month of the amount of babies which are aborted. So just to put it in perspective, but why does it thrive? Why is abortion so popular? Well, I'll tell you why. When a baby is unexpected or inconvenient or imperfect in the eyes of a doctor or parents, um, well, let's just say that uh, we get rid of it. Well, what, what's, what's the point? The point is it threatens our way of life. It threatens our way of life. How is this any different than Pharaoh? Did, did the male children threaten his way of life? Absolutely. They threatened his reign. They threatened his comfort zone. They threatened his slave population. So therefore, get rid of them. They threatened his way of life. A and my friends, this is not about abortion. I already said that once, but this is about anything that we seek to manipulate when it threatens our way of life rather than submitting to God's plan, submitting to his heart for humanity. There are going to be a lot of things in life that are inconvenient. Let me give you another example, discipleship. Discipleship will threaten your way of life. You want to disciple people, you're going to have to invite them into your life. Believe me, discipleship is inconvenient. If you actually do it the way scripture teaches, it's inconvenient. It's not going to fit into your pre-existing lifestyle. Generosity. Generosity will threaten your way of life. You might have to move out of your home to a lower income home. Why? To give as God's called you to give. The point is following God threatens your way of life. This is not about abortion. This is not about Pharaoh and babies that he wanted to kill. This is about my heart and it's about your heart. The question is, what's threatening our way of life in the word of God? And where are we unwilling to yield? We live in a world like Pharaoh. And, and so the first thing that we notice about these women, the first element of godly faithfulness is their focus was on God. And here Pharaoh feels threatened, but these women are not going to go with what Pharaoh feels threatened by. They're going to go by what God's word says. Now, moving on, though, from there, we see that it wasn't just their focus on God. It was their faith in God, their faith in God. And how was their faith in God manifested? Well, clearly, they did not act on what Pharaoh said. So Pharaoh comes back to them in verse 18, says, Why have you done this and let the male children live? And look at their response in verse 19. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. And then it goes on, so God dealt well with the midwives. Let's pause there. I, I want us to think through what they said. First of all, was it a lie? Maybe. Possibly. 
very probably, but that's not even really the point. It's actually difficult to translate that phrase because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women for their vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. I'm not going to go into that much, but let me reiterate or let me make clear what this passage is talking about and what it's not talking about. What it is praising is their faith. What it is not praising is um, their flaws. In other words, our faith, just like Rahab's faith in Joshua chapter 2, she clearly lied. And God, later on in Hebrews 11, was not saying, uh, wow, Rahab was this perfect character. What he's saying is she acted on what she knew. By faith, Rahab did what she did. She hid the spies. Here, by faith, Shifra and Pua acted on what they knew of God, of the character of God, on what was what is right. And, and so I think that we have to recognize this is about their faith. It's not about flawlessness. Uh, but I need to also mention something else, and that is this, that God doesn't need us to lie in any situation. We don't need to lie in order to protect the things of God. You never need to disobey God's word in order to uh, protect the things of the Lord. Um, people sometimes bring up the Corey Ten Boom example. Again, World War II, since we alluded to that war earlier uh, in this episode. But if you don't know Corey Ten Boom's story, she and her family hid um, Jews in their home, and there were times Nazis came and asked, do you have any Jews here? And they would blatantly lie and say they didn't. They had a secret room where these Jews were being hidden. And people say, well, in that context, it's right to lie. But my question is, is God greater? Yes, he's greater. He doesn't need us to protect him in any way. If we're walking in his way, we can walk in truth, absolute truth, and we don't have to fear what may come. I'll give you a couple examples. In that same story, if you read The Hiding Place, which is a story about Corey Ten Boom and them hiding Jews, there was one time that there was a knock on their door. Nazis came asking, do you have any Jews here? And, and it was their little nephew that was um, that was there, and, and he quickly said, yes, we have Jews here. He was speaking the truth, and the Nazis, of course, responded and said, where are they? And he said, under the table. And indeed, they were. There were floorboards that opened, and there were Jews being hidden. But when the the, the Nazis pulled up the tablecloth, they saw a cat under the table and thought this little nephew was mocking them, and therefore they quickly left in a hurry. He told the truth. God still worked. God still protected his people in that home. Another example is the baptism going on in the in the in the nation of China, and, and it was illegal um, in this province to have public baptisms, but the Christians were going to go have this baptism. Well, the police apprehended them, and one rule about the whole baptism thing was you have to actually catch them in the act. It's not just the plan of having it, but it's actually in the act of having it. So when they saw they were going to go have a baptism, um, they asked, are you having a baptism? The Christians did not lie. They said, yes, we are going to go and have a baptism, and it, and it meant prison terms for those being baptized and those doing the baptism is baptizing, but the police said, okay, so they followed them. Knowing that they were going to be arrested when the baptism took place, they continued on. But you know, God sent a storm, and it was a storm that separated the two groups, the police and the ones going to do the baptism, and in the end, no one got arrested. Again, God sent a storm. Does he have to do that? No, he could have had them arrested and gone to jail and served him there and glorified his name in imprisonment, like Paul and many others in Scripture. But the point is that God does not need us to disobey his word in order to protect his plan. He's bigger than that. Um, I also appreciate the fact that they stood up to the king at the risk of their own life. They didn't obnoxiously protest, but they obediently proceeded. I'll say that again. They did not obnoxiously protest, but they obediently proceeded with what they knew to be true. And, uh, and so their commendation, the commendation of Shifra and Pua, it's not about what they didn't do, but rather it is about what they did do. It's not about what they didn't do. It's about what they did do. And so significance, uh, we see here, in God's eyes, it's not about the position that you maintain, but rather it's about your faithfulness in the mundane. Because here they are as midwives. They didn't have a prestigious position. They didn't have a position that would be called a mover and a shaker according to our world today. But what did God do? God took midwives. He took them in their place, in their position, and he used the mundane to glorify his name. So we see their focus on God, 
we see their faith in God. And then what do we notice after that? Well, we see their favor, their favor from God. Look at verse 20. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong. So God dealt well with the midwives. And then verse 21 says, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. There we have a description of verse 20. How did he deal well with the midwives? Well, first of all, the people multiplied and grew strong. So the midwives brought blessing to others, but notice the favor of God on the midwives themselves. He gave them families. This is actually a very significant thing. If you look back in history, back to that day, typically, and I'm not saying this is an absolute, but you will find this as a common theme in uh, in, in, in in historical writings from uh, relating to these days, that midwives often were barren and hence that's why they became a midwife because midwife had to be available at any time of day or night and if you're raising a family if you're if you're overseeing a home that can be a very difficult thing so it was it was a, a in their in their mind a good place for barren women to be midwives well if that was the case barrenness is oftentimes seen as a curse a curse from god of course we know that's not the case and if that's you today and you're praying for a child, keep praying. The Lord is more than able to give that child to you. But at the same time, if he chooses not to, that's not God's curse on your life. Perhaps it is just like Shifra and Pua in positioning you in such a place where he intends to use you greatly for his glory. So I say to you who are hurting today, press on. But in this context, he gave them families. He gave them families. So, uh, again, the favor from God. And we know ultimately as children of God, we have that favor from God. Because when we are in Christ, well, who is Christ before the Father? This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And so we know that he takes pleasure in his Son. And for those of us in him, what a position we have before God as highly favored ones, as the angel even said to Mary. So we have the emphasis that God puts on faithfulness. We have the elements of godly faithfulness, these three things, their focus, faith, and favor. But now we finally see the esteem of God regarding faithfulness, the esteem of God regarding faithfulness. And and, and what is this esteem that we're speaking of? Well, maybe first you need to know my definition of esteem. It's not mine. It's actually straight from the dictionary, but I want us to be on the same page. Esteem means respect and admiration, typically for a person. And what is that admiring? What is that respecting that um, God puts? Well, how does he show that in Exodus 1? Well, here's what I want you to notice. When you walk through this chapter, you're going to notice that Pharaoh is simply called Pharaoh. We've mentioned this. His name's not there. And why is his name not there? Well, I, I think there's intentionality. We don't need to know who it was. Why? He's just not that important. I'm not saying he didn't do big things in the eyes of the world, but God's like in Pharaoh. <laughs> Pharaoh. We never find out any Pharaoh's name in this book of Exodus because Pharaoh's just Pharaoh. Different Pharaohs. Pharaohs come, Pharaohs go. But let me tell you, when a Shifra comes, we'll remember it forever. When a Pua comes, we'll remember it forever. It's interesting because uh, who does Pharaoh want to get rid of? Well, all the baby boys. All the baby boys. Who does God specifically choose to use as his unexpected heroes in this account? Well, Shifra, Pua, a woman coming up named Jochebed, another woman named Miriam, and then Pharaoh's daughter. Well, that's interesting. Because all five have something in common. And what is that? Well, all five are women. All five are women. Women, the very ones that Pharaoh said, those are not threats. Those are not heroes. Those are not the ones who bring about deliverance. I don't need to worry about them. But the boys. Kill the boys. And leave the girls. I love God's way of working. He uses those who are counted out. He uses those who the world perhaps deem of no value. You know, th this is the way our God works. There's a great um, story uh, of a man named Edward Kimball, and perhaps you've heard his name before. He uh, uh, was a Sunday school teacher back uh, in the 1800s, mid-1800s, and one day uh, a young man um, came to his class, and following up with him, 
um, he went to the Holton shoe store where this young man was working. And, and it's interesting because this young man is going to come to Christ later on in the story. But this young man was very unconcerned about his soul, per se. And, uh, and he wrote in his journal later on, One day I recollect my teacher, Edward Kimball, coming around behind the counter of the shop where I was at work. And he put his hand on my shoulder and talked to me about Christ and my soul. And I had not felt that I had a soul till then. I said to myself, this is a very strange thing. Here's a man who never saw me till lately, and he's weeping over my sins. And I never shed a tear about them. But I understand it now and know what it is to have a passion for men's souls and to weep over their sins. I don't remember what he said, but I can feel the power of that man's hand on my shoulder tonight. It was not long after that I was brought into the kingdom of God. It's interesting because Edward Kimball actually walked past the store. He, he wasn't even sure he should go in. He was a little nervous to go and talk to this individual. But who was this individual that he talked to that came to Christ because of his faithfulness to go and visit a shoe store and a follow-up to a Sunday school class? Well, that man was Dwight L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody, who many of you would recognize his name, who um, was a great evangelist and preacher. And it was through his ministry that another man, F.B. Meyer, came to Christ. And F.B. Meyer was a great expositor, and God used him to lead a man named Wilbur Chapman to Christ. And Wilbur Chapman, uh, later on, um, employed an ex-baseball player, some of you would recognize his name, Billy Sunday, um, as his assistant. Well, Billy Sunday became a great evangelist, and he ended up preaching in Charlotte, North Carolina at, um, at this uh, uh, Billy Sunday's Layman Evangelistic Club meeting, and a guy named Mordecai Ham was there, and Mordecai Ham heard the gospel, and he um, came to Christ. And then, after Mordecai Ham came to Christ, he was preaching, and through his ministry, another man named Billy Graham was saved. Well, what's the point of this whole story? From Edward Kimball to Billy Graham, all connected through faithfulness each step of the way. But where did it start? It didn't start with Dwight L. Moody. It didn't start with, okay, I guess we could say it didn't start with Edward Kimball either. But this story starts with Ed Edward Kimball, because we could go back, who led Edward Kimball to Christ. The point being is mundane faithfulness, faithfulness to go to a shoe store, faithfulness to talk to somebody that God burdened you to talk to, faithfulness to follow up. It led to ultimately Billy Graham being saved. And I'm wondering if there's somebody listening to this today where you came to Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. You came to Christ through Billy Graham's ministry or the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I don't know. Well, you're the next step in this story. But what's the point of it? The point of it is little is much when God is in it. Uh, that's actually a quote from a song written by Kitty Suffield back in 1924. She wrote, little as much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. And I love this one verse of the song. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own. Let me ask you a few questions as we close. What's your, eva what's your evaluation system? How do you deem value? How do you assess value? Do we assess significance based on what our eyes can see? Based on what uh, our understanding of an action is? Uh, in other words, based on our, understand or our perception of what's going to come from something? Um, do we value things highly um, based on faithfulness? Um, in, in what we know, or do we base valuation on what we see? In other words, God says it's required in a steward that a man be found faithful. He values faithfulness even when we don't know what's going to come from it. He values faithfulness when we are in the position of a midwife, and day in and day out, we are choosing to bypass the compromise of the world for the truth of what God values in each life, and that is that you are created in the image of God. So I encourage you, reassess your situation. Maybe a situation you thought, hmm, it's just really not that important. Reassess. Recognize your fears. What fears are driving you? Is it the fear of man? Because that's going to lead to oppression of someone or something. Or is it the fear of God, which will lead to obedience to God's word? So reassess your situation, recognize your fears, and then respond in faith. Uh, respond with what you know today. I understand there's a lot that you don't understand. There's a lot you don't know. Same is true with me. But respond in faith to the word of God that you know today and know that God honors such faithfulness. We're out of time, but this has been Into Your Bible. And my prayer, as always, is that you would be one who loves the Word of God and the God of the Word.